Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Royal Photographic Society and this new season of awards talks. It's a pleasure to introduce Joe, introduce Joe McDonald, our awards manager, who will introduce our speakers this evening. Joe, over to you. Thank you. Welcome to tonight's conversation with Tom Hunter and Zelda Cheetle. Tom is an artist using photography and film, living and working in East London. He's an honorary fellow of the Royal Photographic Society and has an honorary doctorate from the University of East London. Tom has earned several awards during his career, including the Rose Award for Photography at the Royal Academy London. Zelda Cheetle is a curator, editor and consultant. After working as a photographer, she worked as a gallerist at the Photographer's Gallery from 1982 to 1988. Her own gallery opened in 1989 until 2005, exhibiting the work of many important photographers. She continues to work as a freelance curator, writer and reviewer of photography. Zelda was given the Society's Outstanding Service to Photography Award in 2021. A new exhibition curated by Zelda will be opening at RPS House on Friday the 9th of September. The exhibition is entitled Squaring the Circles of Confusion and includes work by Tom, Joy Gregory and Susan Durgis amongst others. We will be taking Q&A after the conversation. If you have questions, please enter them in the Zoom chat. Over to you, Tom Zelda. Thank you, Joe. That's a lovely introduction. Um, I think Tom and I have known each other a long time, so this is going to be a very pleasant thing to be able to actually chat for a whole hour, almost interrupted, um, uninterrupted. Um, and I thought that, Tom, we would start really with you at the very beginning, whenever you were at school and you were being offered the factory or the farm and what you did. Um, hi, Zelda. Um, hi, Michael. Hi, Joe. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, yeah, I, um, I was at school in Dorset where I grew up and it was a factor of the farm. I wasn't very good in education. I enjoyed being at school, but um, I wasn't very learned. I think I've got a bit of dyslexia. Uh, I left school at 15 and uh, from first of all, the farm and then the Forestry Commission, cutting down trees, digging ditches. And then eventually that led me to London um, and I became a tree lopper. Some people call it a tree surgeon, but I think that's a bit grand, really. But I did swing around in trees, cutting branches off in Regent's Park. So uh, that was my sort of early sort of 10 years of, of till I sort of about 25. Yeah. But Tom, it was very significant that you came to London. And I think it was Trafalgar Square that actually led you into that those amazing, the portal of the National Gallery, which I think was a very pivotal moment for you, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Having the show at the National Gallery, I think it's the only solo photography show they've had at the National Gallery. Um, and obviously that was a huge highlight for my life and of my photographic practice and career. Yeah, coming out on just before Christmas, looking out over Trafalgar Square, those lights and the column and House of Parliament and having photography being appreciated and viewed in that in that setting. My work's about referencing art historical paintings so to be put in that setting was was a um yeah re really satisfying moment yeah really, yeah so really how lovely. did you go from um lopping the trees to walking into lcc as a student of photography um yeah it was a sort of long winding road but um uh, i did get had enough after a while of clocking in um and being told what to do every day um, so I decided to hit the road as it were and head west. So I bought a one-way ticket to Canada and I hitched around the States for nearly a year, well, actually no, uh, sort of six, six months around that sort of time. Um, and I took an old Pentax camera and I started taking snaps as it were. Um, and I just thought about what I wanted to do in my life in that time. And I thought photography would be amazing. I came back from that trip and all the photographs were ruined, the camera wasn't working. Oh, so it's Tom, I didn't know so, that. I didn't know that none existed. Crying. Yeah, so six months of photography. This mm -hmm. I thought would launch my career and the camera wasn't working, little known to me. So I got it all processed when I got back. And, but it's, yeah, the inspiration was there. And the, but the also, it maybe is a, a lesson that you needed to learn how to use the camera and look at 
you know, start seeing that you didn't yeah. need the evidence, but very interesting. So yeah. you had nothing then to show after six months nothing of your way. Yeah. And so but, how um, did you talk your way into? Yeah, so I um uh I enrolled on an evening class at Kingsway College. Right. Um, and I think that was two two nights a week. Um, and I started taking pictures of the markets, uh, Brick Lane Market, where I was working at the time. So I was buying stuff in jumble sales, selling it on the street, fly pitching. So and do you want that, to start putting those Brick Lane pictures up and talking over it? Because this is <clears> so <throat> fascinating that um, Brick Lane has changed from the days that you were selling stuff from jumble sales. It has a bit, yeah. Yeah. It was quite an incredible place. Um, it was. So, yeah, so I, I called this series Down the Lane. So this is sort of the late 80s. And I was living in a squat in Hackney. Um, and I just had my bric-a-brac on the pavement. Um, and, yeah, and these are my customers. So I just <laughs> put three pictures. And you can see, yeah, they weren't particularly happy that I was sticking the camera in their face. But it was my territory, as it were, and they were coming into my house. And it was very, as you can see, I was very influenced by the early black and white street photographers um, and the grit and the reality. Um, but incredibly beautiful people. It was an incredibly rich area, not in money, obviously. It was incredibly poor. But, yeah, the, the old Jewish community was still there. The Bangladeshi yep. community were moving in. <clears throat> Incredible mixture of people. Um, and cultures so that really enriched my whole outlook of wanting to be involved with communities and trying to portray them so the next pictures that you put we're, we're sort of working chronologically through this yeah, i think it's a right. good idea yeah. um so the next ones are they the ghetto that we're going to look at next that's right. so that, that, those pictures <clears throat> my tutor thought they were worthy of something um, and he said, because I thought I'd just get a portfolio together and I'll start work as a commercial photographer. Um, and he said, why don't I try to do a degree? And it was free grants at the at the time, um, free education, further education. So I thought, OK, let's try that. Um, so I applied to London College of Printing um, and I started a degree course. And this article came out in my local paper and it called the street and the, and the place I was squatting a ghetto. So I started taking photographs of my neighborhood, uh, the people I live with, and I made a model of the street. So this is this is on permanent display at the Museum of London. It's a model, it's got five, four transparencies in the window backlit, and it's all made of photographs. It's about uh, 18 it's foot long, yeah. about 10 foot wide. The houses are about a foot or so high, foot and a half high. And you wander around, you look into the houses um, and you see, my friends um, and my neighbourhood. Um, and it did feel quite special. It did feel as though it was going to end quite soon as I'd lived in lots of squats and they did get taken back. So I wanted to document that. So I was very interested in documentary. And my community, I'm, I'm making a positive representation of my friends and the people I loved and lived with. But I mean, this doctor. was kind of the first real engagement with Hackney, wasn't it? That... It was, yeah. And this is my first picture. <laughs> well, my first pictures with a large format camera. So the ones before were all shot on the 35 millimeter yeah. uh, Pentax, very light, very flexible. And then I changed to this huge, great big 5.4 monorail camera, which weighed a ton. Um, I bought from an auction. Um, so taking single shots on film, sheet film. And then, it, yeah, it, it changed everything. I became really obsessed by the colour, by the beauty. Um, and at the time, you know, it's it Thatcher's Britain, and it was all about, you know, marginalisation, certain groups of in society. So they were being stigmatised, squatters, travellers, road protesters. Um, and they were shown in very black and white, grainy um, newspaper articles, usually quite derogatory. So I wanted to show... They were human, and the humanity and the dignity of these people was incredibly important to me. Yeah, lovely. And this went on after I left London for a while. I bought a double-decker bus. This is a bus I lived in for a couple of years. This is my girlfriend at the time. Um, and we travelled around Europe, which were on free raves and parties. And again, a stigmatised group. And I wanted to just show the people for how I saw them. These quiet, relaxing moments 
when we weren't having the big parties, weren't there wasn't drug taking, you know, just normal people living their lives, but in unusual circumstances. I think that you should share though with this audience just about um, your veggie burgers that you used to make. I think they said it's so, you had to come back <laughs> yeah. to London at one point. <laughs> yeah, we, we made our money. We bought sacks of SOX mix, as someone called it, the sauce mix. So it's vegetarian burger mix. Um, we bought sacks of it in London before we left and sacks of muesli. And then wherever we went, we bought crates and crates of beer. So we had a little cafe selling veggie burgers, egg butties and beer. And that's what <laughs> we lived on for. Yeah, I'd never eat a veggie burger again in my whole life. <laughs> sure. So, uh, yeah. yeah, so it was free parties, free music and cheap veggie burgers. So we were sustaining the ravers. Um, and so that's how we traveled. So it was, uh, and really fun. You had really a lot of fun. Yeah, it was an amazing time, amazing people. There's a whole community who have been travelling on the road for sort of generations, really, in England, going to free festivals from Stonehenge all around the country. And then it got clamped down on the UK. So a lot of people um, made an exodus for Europe and we carried on that lifestyle. So sometimes we were travelling on convoys of up to 50 vehicles of buses and trucks and vans, Lovely. going to Czech Republic, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Austria france germany meeting incredible people and people were like wow you're putting this on for free wow what's this music so oh, it's brilliant what an amazing brilliant. time yeah um shall i keep it oh yeah just a another picture um and then uh persons unknown so i mentioned a little bit about my referencing uh classical painting um after i've been on the road for a couple of years i applied to go to the Royal College of Art, where I met you. Um, yep. The reason why I went to the Royal College of Art was because of you as well, Zelda. You know, I You're went joking. to your gallery on um, Charing Cross Road, just off the Charing Cross Road. Yep. And I was like, wow, this is so special. Your gallery and the photographer's gallery were so inspirational to me as someone wanting to be in that world. And I remember going in one day and, um, uh, oh, my God, uh, well, I can't remember his name. Oh, the guy who did Jubilee, the film, and Blue. Oh, Derek Jarman. Derek Jarman was there. Sorry, he's completely put up my mind. Sorry. He was there with you, chatting away. And I thought, oh, my God, this is the coolest place in the world. Derek Jarman <laughs> in a photography gallery. This is where I want to be. And I think a few months later, you had Royal College student show in the yeah. gallery. <clears throat> I thought, this is a way maybe I can get into that world. <laughs> So I applied to go to Royal College of Art. Um, oh, and brilliant. you did a tutorial there. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Um, yeah, well, yeah. I think I have is... such fantastic memories of all of that year. For about seven years, I was in photography at the Royal College. And I think I'm still friends with so many really fantastic people that were there then. I mean, I yeah. think yeah. it's changed a bit now, but there were such small groups of people in, in those days. Um, and yeah. you just got to know people so well. And people's... Yeah. I mean, their practice really, really developed during that couple of years. It was such a good time. Yeah, 14 students in a year, two years. Yeah. It's, it's very different now, a whole of education. But, um, but anyway, I got inspired by Vermeer. Um, Peter Kennard said, why don't you actually, you know, make that obvious within your work? Because I've been referencing the, the, uh, the Dutch masters before with the light and compositions. I looked at one. Um, I reimagined it. This is an eviction notice that I got from a squat in Hackney. This is my my friend and neighbour. I'm still really good friends with. We've just been texting, actually. Um, this is Philippa with her baby, as was. She's 25 now. This is Saskia. Um, so this is next door to me. This is in a squat in Hackney. She's reading the eviction notice. So I called it woman reading, um, woman reading a possession order. Um, and yeah, this picture probably changed my life, really. Um, went into the degree show and it's been shown in national galleries from America to, to Poland, to Germany, to the Prada in Spain. Um, and I wanted to show the dignity of this, these people who have been evicted. Um, and I wanted to make the references to art history of, you know, when Vermeer was doing his paintings, he wanted to focus on the community around him. It wasn't about the kings, the queens, the generals high society. It was about the ordinary moments around him. And by giving ordinary people that light and light, 
it gives them dignity and gives them a sense of well-being and worth. So this is a, a campaigning picture, really, to save our community from eviction. Well, so, it's, it's, so I just want to flag up that, I mean, I think the exhibition at the Dunwich Picture Gallery that was called Woman in the Window, yeah, I mean, it was based on a Rembrandt that they had in their collection, but it was a magnificent exhibition. And as I walked past the back, well, the front of Dunwich Picture Gallery last week, there was this picture in the window of Dunwich Picture Gallery. So the woman in the window was also the woman in the window. It was so nice. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a great picture. And I think it really has reverberated. I mean, since you took it, it has been seen many, many times. But it's it's a glorious picture. Yeah, and I think for me, I really wanted to be involved with beauty and calmness. Um, but beauty with a meaning, so there's a political is a real political punch this i think you're seduced into it by the beauty of it and then you read what's actually happening about eviction so there's that twist to it and it was a strange time you know Sarchi saw this and he said i don't really like tom hunter's work he didn't know it was me i don't like political work work shouldn't be political this is back in 97 and i did feel as i was really out of time and then six months later he came and he bought all the work um so it's funny uh how how different things happen, different fashions, and you just have to be true to yourself. And exactly, and you just make true to my community. Yes. Yeah, I think you were doing something that was nothing to do with its commercial value. You were doing something um, for very, very um, worthy reasons, as opposed to um, what Charles Archie might say to you. Yeah, um, and the, the greatest thing about this is we saved our streets. So there's a, we nearly have hundreds, yes. nearly a hundred people living there. <laughs> And we saved the street, the two streets. They run back to back. Um, my friends are still there today with their children. They brought up their children they brought home. Some of them are grandparents now. So that community is still right in the centre of Hackney. So that's my greatest accomplishment that I've well, helped to preserve that community. So that's really important. Um, and then there's a, yeah, the art of painting. I changed to the art of squatting. Um, again, my friends, my neighbours, based on the Vermeer, um, and the whole community, the whole buildings became for me work of art. You know, people ripped off, made holes in floors, made holes in walls, uh, painted from the skip, you know, paints they found in the skip, decorated from things they found on the street. We were upcycling, we were recycling, we were taking waste, because the whole area was due for demolition. And we, we, we reimagined it and gave it life. Oh, which um, is brilliant. So it was quite an amazing place. <clears throat> um, and this is this is Holly Street. So this is a massive council estate just on the other side of London Fields to where we were living. Um, and I was given a flat there for a while and I spent about two years working there. Um, this is my first commission that I, I worked for a small charity called the Hackney Building Exploratory, and they were looking at social housing issues. <clears throat> so I spent literally, yeah, weeks and weeks and weeks walking up and down 19 floors of this tower block, um, getting stuck in lifts, yeah. So it's but this, this work, it sort of, it led almost directly into a place for us, didn't it? The film that you made with the yeah. Serpentine. Yeah. Because there was, you obviously made real friends in Holly Street, but yeah. there's something so tender. And I mean, just the way that you had with the people that are in the film, a place for us, it's really, it was very moving. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And people in social housing, people in council housing were seen as, as a problem, um, seen as not worthy of being, being depicted. And by taking in my large, for my camera I felt like a royal court painter we were using polaroids I was giving them dignity I was giving them a chance to show their homes before these tower blocks were blown up one was left but all these people's yeah. homes were destroyed and they were saying oh they need to be destroyed this is this is not a good place to live but they were great they were really lovely apartments just they've been starved of money so there's no no one on the doors so they've been left to rot with these people in it so i really wanted to capture their lives with dignity and humanity um so that was another really really great project to have worked on um and you can see that you know the poverty in this picture but the humanity strikes much more i think you know this boy's beautiful face and the way he looks up and their and their children you know i'm a 
And I'm a bad photographer, you know, I had this great big old clunky camera. I couldn't use a flash, I didn't have lights. So they're all <laughs> long exposures. But in some ways it gives it quite a, um, a sort of magical atmosphere, which I was, you know, which I'm quite glad that I don't know everything and you can make mistakes. And then with, with, when you shoot on 5.4 transparency, when you get it back, you can't just throw it away. If this was shot on digital, I'd probably delete it and take a picture so they were all in focus. But once you shot on film and you get that back, you can't throw it away because it's so expensive. So you hold on to it. Mm. So it's a very different way of working. I'm not against digital, but it was a very different way of working, that's for sure. Um, yeah. And this was a, this is actually a flat where they had um uh this this is EU uh, luncheon meat. So the EU used to send lunch and meat <laughs> to this estate to help feed the people what did the eu ever do for us eh well they fed people in uh, the <laughs> <laughs> we'll be getting that anymore <clears throat> um and yeah and then again i made a model of the tablet this is about 10 foot tall and then you look into the into the windows five four transparencies lit up from behind and you walk around it and i'm in i'm in negotiations at the moment so i'm hoping that the Museum of London will take this model as well, and they're going to feature it when they open their new museum. When they oh, open, oh, I it. hope so. That'd be fabulous. It should be that with be really the lovely. street. It'd be great yeah. to have them both together. Yeah. Um, and I think it, I'd love this piece of. Work. I think it's it's yeah. yeah, it's a it's a real testament to a time and a place and those lives. And we also did we did our filming, so we we record live stories, and we had little screens inside there, and the lovely. people talk about growing up living in Hackney, living at that time, because it was such a different time, the poverty and, but, but when they moved in as well, the hope and the, and the enthusiasm for this modern housing was, was, was just so poignant. And then it all faded away. And now, yeah, everyone wants to live in a, in a tower block in Hackney. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and this takes me on to, I did a, I did a residency in, um, in Imma, in Dublin. My grandmother is was from Dublin, I believe. She died when my dad was very young. I got to Dublin, I didn't know what I was doing, so I started looking at Ulysses and James Joyce, and I came across this quote, yeah, the snot green sea, um, and I dived into the sea in Dublin Bay at the 40 foot, and yes, my scrotum did tighten, my god, it's cold <laughs> in March. So that was quite amazing, and I, and I, um, a friend of mine, a guy called Paul Smith, who was a tutor at London College of Printing, he made me this camera, this pinhole camera, with a 5.4 back on it. So shooting on 5.4 with this box, I use a sock as a shutter, and I'm doing these long exposures of all these bathing places around Dublin Bay, these Victorian places where the, the Victorians went into the sea. And for me, the, the bay becomes like a pregnant mother, and it sort of... It reminds me of all the people that are left island, left from the famine or through economic hardships, or if it is, and gone to London or gone to New York or gone to Sydney. Um, and uh, yeah, traveled across the sea and started new lives. So this is this is sort of the beginning, um, the birth of people's lives. So I thought that was quite interesting. So there's no people in this, in this series, <clears throat> but it's all about the people that left this place and started new lives. So it's about immigration and migration and travel. But this is your first use of the pinhole? That's right, yeah. 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 And so here we, we've come to the places of prayer. So this, um, from what I gather, all of your places of prayer are in Hackney, is that right? Yes, they are. Although, I, yeah, I always say this and I always get something wrong. Um, so there'll be someone who realizes this, uh, there's a Greek church just on Mare Street. Um, and then this, I did take a picture of that. And then this isn't strictly in Hackney. This is actually in Islington. So it's another Greek church, um, which I, yeah. But they are all in that sort of area of yeah. sort of northeast London around me. Um, um, and yeah, I, I, I went to I went to Dublin and the burden of responsibility. When you photograph people, you have a burden to represent them and to talk about people's lives. And it's quite a heavy burden. If you misrepresent people, people can get very upset. Um, you know, the picture of the girl with the hat on, she was my girlfriend. I, that went into the Guardian, I remember. 
and we talked about squatters and she her headmaster she was a teacher got quite upset about it so conversations with people and letting people images go to the right place and how you use people's pictures is is um is a great responsibility so i sort of shrank away from it a bit when i got to ireland i really wanted to just ease up and then when i came back to london i thought actually i want to be quite interested to be a tourist in my own neighborhood so i'm visiting all these amazing places which you normally don't go into places which are devoid of commercial exploitation which is quite incredible because everywhere you go really is you know places like the pubs or shops or museums it's all about money and then these places it's about meditation contemplation and prayer so i went in there went into these places and it was um this is a synagogue um a chapel and this one this is actually i think it's a 15 minute exposure so obviously these are prayer mats this is a turkish mosque of on Kingsham Road. And there's actually about 30 people in this photograph. So I set up the camera. I'm speaking to the Imam. We're having a lovely conversation. People are coming in. They're praying um, on these mats and they're walking out. So they leave this ghostly spirit, which I follow. And there's no shutter, there's no flash. Um, I put the sock in front of the hole. I take it away. And I, I find it incredibly respectful of other people's cultures and other people's places. So it was well, a very, something very nice you know, about slowing everything down, Tom. I mean, and I think yes. a pinhole, you can't do that in a hurry. And that it's kind of, it is, it sort of induces a sense of meditation because everything to do with the pinhole, the way you've taken it is slow, but then even the way that you approach it is very, um, it slows you down. It's very nice. Yeah, so it's just a day's work taking one picture. I bracket, so I do three different exposures. So eight minutes for one shot, 15 minutes for another shot and half an hour for another shot. And then yeah. you have to speak to the in-man and, and you spend some quite time talking about, you know, um, uh, uh, the, the religion and the place and the history. So you don't just charge in, uh, take yeah. a snap and run away. So it's completely opposite of how I started off. Um, and that doesn't mean I don't like those pictures. You know, I've, I've shown those pictures this year. And I love those pictures I took on Brick Lane. And I think they, they're they an amazing document of that time and place. But there's different ways of working, which are... And also you, you, yeah. you kind of grow as a photographer because you've got different expectations of yourself as well, which mm. is, um, I think that's important. Yeah, you have to, well, to make it interesting for yourself, you have to change and try new yeah. things out and explore... Um, and feel comfortable and sometimes you don't feel comfortable taking pictures of certain people in certain situations and you have to find different ways and different methods of approaching subjects um, which can work for you and your subjects which is important uh, yeah this is just in someone's house actually a mosque just off just near tesco's in hackney so i did a whole oh, this is actually um this is actually a, a um a stone a, a mason's um temple free oh, mason's really? <laughs> temple in the great eastern hotel it's called something different now but um the uh comrade terence comrade went in there and i think it's the 80s and um, was looking through the plans and he found this wall that shouldn't be there so they got the builders and they smashed through this wall and they found this temple it was How bricked amazing. up in the second world war and they forgot about it and it's the most <laughs> incredible building uh the wow. room, this temple you can i think some artists have made a film about it but it's yeah it's a bit like eyes wide shut with yeah uh, yeah if you can imagine yeah. what thing goes <laughs> it's very sandy kubrick it is it definitely yeah yeah um how are we doing for time are we going yeah we've, we're halfway through so that we're doing okay. not not bad okay yeah we're going quite quickly then aren't we um uh, this is this is another series, um, unheralded stories, and again, but this is going back to our history again, and going back to the people in Hackney. Um, obviously, I'm mentioning Hackney a lot. It's my neighbourhood, um, and it's a place where I live, and I make my connections. Um, and I did get a bit, you know. Uh, Someone said it must be very boring just to work in the same neighborhood all the time. I remember an artist saying that to me. 
And I can see their point of view, but in other ways, you just get to see the minutia. You get to know people, you get to hear stories, um, and you can really, really elaborate on on these on these situations. So this is um, obviously based on Andrew Wyeth. This is a council estate in Clapton and Hackney on Hackney Marshes, where my boy's just gone off to play football. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is a friend, and we were reenacting when this estate was squatted, and there was a mass eviction and people being forced out of their places. Um, so each one has got a story about the lives and people around Hackney. So um, I don't always tell the stories, and sometimes you just look at the picture and hope there's something which, yeah, they become hopefully like film stills, but, or filmatic in the way that you have to imagine the beginning of the film, what's happening now and the end of the film. Um, and it's very much up to the viewer to use their imagination to think about what's going on. And sometimes it's quite nice for me to tell you what I imagine. And sometimes I find other people's interpretations much more interesting than my own. And they place themselves in the situation. They become the protagonists within the scenario, which I find really interesting. Um, yeah, this is about um, Angelica. And I thought, you know, it's quite interesting, you know, when you go to somewhere like the National Gallery, yeah, most women are naked or sent in quite a sexualized way and the myths. Um, and this is my friend's daughter. And this is again on Hackney Marshes. With the, um, and these incredible plants, they're almost like something out of the, the Amazon. And I thought that was really interesting that, um, it's almost like uh, I've gone to the great the, the Amazon forest. I haven't needed to travel the, around the world. Haven't needed to go off to California to find the dry redwoods. I've actually made my own forests of nature and found that in Hackney. And this girl, she was really into Dungeons and Dragons, so she's almost imagining this dragon coming down. And so this is my friend's daughter, Roisin. Um, So yeah, I find it really interesting just exploring these sort of out of the way places although the banks of the river lee now aren't out of the way since covid there have been hundreds of people swimming there and um and enjoying that area so it's, it's quite different but back then it seemed to be quite isolated i seem to be the only person cycling around with a big camera but um um and then no, i think it was paul strand that said that everything you need is within a quarter of a mile of your own front door so exactly. that in fact and you are the perfect example of that tom that You've got it in Hackney. There is everything is there. Exactly. Yeah, well, this is a, this is a great yeah. one to have. Um, this yeah. Delacroix now because this is very poignant because it's in the exhibition. Exactly. Yeah. So I've been obs I, I, obsessed. It's a funny word, but I've loved this this painting for a long time. It's just such a bizarre painting, and I thought it was really interesting that the French artists from Paris going off to the Middle East or the Near East. Um, and making these cultural judgments and depictions on, on societies they didn't really know much about and making it into this grand mystique, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and then you know, this is about a sultan who's dying. So on his deathbed, he wants all his harem, all his, all his women killed and his horses killed, everything to be killed when he dies, which is just, just such a bizarre story. And this picture is just so bizarre. Um, and then, I don't know if you can see my mouse moving, but the girl on the bed with her arms, I don't know, it's just such a, she's just going to be have her throat cut and killed because this bloke is dying, which is just bizarre, isn't it? So um, I reinvented it. And this is this is in this show um, at um, <clears throat> the Royal Photographic Society in Bristol, which opens on Friday. And um, this is... The picture on the right on the mantelpiece is the grandmother. So this is an Italian woman who's come from Italy. And this is a flat above her shot, a shop on um, Graham Road, just around the corner from me in Hackney. Um, set up the shop as a restaurant, Italian restaurant. And over the years, it became bastardised. It used to sell ice cream and pasta and then ended up selling eggs, chips and beans. And then uh, she died a number of years ago. And I went into the flat. I met the granddaughter. Um, and they showed me and she died on this very bed. The stains are from her from her bodily fluids when she died. And this apartment became a shrine to her Catholic identity. So for me, it's like I wanted to make the grand myth 
about the cultures that have come to Hackney. Hackney and the East End has always been a place where different people have travelled to. They've come, they've set up shop, they come quite often from poverty and they build their lives and they set their children and their grandchildren on different destinies. Um, so I really wanted to sort of talk about that incredibly how incredibly lucky we are in this part of London to have all these rich cultures these incredible people enhancing and giving us so much of their culture their society their food so this is a homage to that lifestyle um, and then obviously the place was sold and I think it's turned into a kebab shop now so yeah <laughs> it's a Turkish kebab shop which almost goes back to that the original to the original painting exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's got, like, the, the big uh, knives and the cutting and <laughs> So I'm just trying, so I suppose what I'm trying to do is, is people go into like a little, little cafe and they just don't think anything of it. It's just ordinary, it's quite dull. And I'm trying to find the magic in my neighbourhood. And I'm also saying to other people, like you said, there's magic in every neighbourhood and you don't need to go to Afghanistan, you don't need to go off to the Middle East to find these incredible rituals. It's all around us, so it's very much a part of that. Um, Actually, I've got a lot faster than I thought, but a, a sideshow of a sideshow um, is something I've been working on for a few years. Um, and I went to Jordan, but this is actually where I grew up in Dorset. This is my local church. Um, and it was quite an incredible thing to find this man, this white man in Arab garb in my local church in Wareham in, in, in Dorset. And this is uh, Lawrence of Arabia, T.H. Lawrence. Um, and he died on a motorbike accident just around the corner from where I grew up. And I grew up racing motorbikes on the tank ranges where he lived on Clowes Hill. And I got quite interested in his life and the legacy of the British and French going into the Middle East and carving it up. Um, so I went to some of the forts in the desert where, where Lawrence fought from, where he lived. And I, I actually worked in Amman for six months um, I was on an artist residency and I worked with uh, a number of groups from Palestinian refugee groups. Um, you know, half the population of Jordan is made up of Palestinian refugees. And I think there's over a million Syrian refugees there. Um, and Jordan's a, quite a strange country. I think there's more, there's more uh, refugees than there are actual population. Um, and these people come there and they're sort of, God's waiting room. They sort of just waiting to go off to Germany or to the UK or to America to start their lives properly. So we were looking at that sort of legacy of of imperialism, um, in this case Roman imperialism and British imperialism. Um, and I travelled quite a lot. These are these are two Syrian refugees. So I went to the Syrian border, and I went to some of the big Syrian refugee camps. But this is actually a a tiny refugee camp is probably just one tribe, maybe 100 people on this camp, just across the border. Um, they had their sheep, they brought their tents, they had their pickups, and they sort of zigzag across the border. So I spent some time with these people. Um, and just, yeah, the richness and the beauty of these, of these people's lives and what they're doing and how they, and how they, even though it's a desperate situation, they make their lives. And then also I suppose, their sort of generosity and hospitality and friendliness. It's just amazing that it's, it's all yeah. so um, misunderstood and yeah. they're fantastic people. Yeah. And the way they invited me into their home, you know, and, yeah. and yeah, gave me tea and looked after me, even though they're the people that are suffering. And I'm the privileged person in this incredibly privileged position to go out there. Um, and then, you know, this was a time when the jungle was uh the jungle was legitimate no that's the wrong word this is when the jungle was still a jungle um and my friend who i traveled with on the road he had a big sound system called bedlam sound system he set up a refugee community kitchen in calais so i volunteered out there and i went out there and i did some washing up for a day and then ended up actually me and my friends went out with we ended up doing the mechanics on the vehicles. They would deliver, I think, 1,500 meals a day to the refugees. So I spent a number of weeks there, um, staying in a hostel, and yeah, spent quite a lot of time in the refugee camp. And this was before it was bulldozed. It's still going on now, um, and he's still got his community kitchen there. There's still refugees are still there, trying to, trying to set up their lives. 
But this part of it is all gone now. These people have set up shops and houses from the waste the squatter camps. So in some ways they were a bit like the camps that we had, but obviously we were incredibly privileged. I could have gone back to my mum if I was desperate, but these guys, they couldn't go back to their There's mom. nowhere to, to go, exactly. There's nowhere to go. They can't go back. They've been hounded out of their country. They've been forced. And, you know, it, it's, it's part of our legacy. As, as an imperial power, we've set up these, these, these actions that we did 100 years ago. Um, and, yeah, I believe we should take some responsibility of it. So I was sort of looking at that. <clears throat> um, and where have we got to now, a journey home? Oh, yeah. Um, this, is, this is a commission that I did in Hastings with someone called Lucy Bell. Um, and we did about, again, that notion of home. Home is, I think, the main theme of my work. Um, and in some ways, I was very privileged to be a squatter. Um, there was empty places we could just walk into in Hackney, places which were just abandoned. And we had a good time. Um, and we had a great sense of community, but we were threatened with eviction constantly. Um, and I would have preferred to have a nice place to live. Um, uh, but these guys, this is Ali from Afghanistan. And again, he was driven out of his home. He traveled all the way across you know, Europe, in the UK, and I did this project on taxi drivers. So we did all these oral histories of people and how they ended up in Hastings. And what is their notion of home? And again, I wanted to show the sort of beauty of their lives. And this sort of reminded me of, I don't know, poppy fields in Afghanistan. So these taxi drivers would take me out to locations that they sort of connected with. And when they were driving us, they would, uh, we would interview them and do all the recordings about their lives. Um, so we could share these stories. These people that we get in in the taxi and we don't, we sort of just ignore them. We just chat with our friends in the back of a taxi. Um, and these people have just become like the silent workers out there. And I thought, it was, actually, they need to have their time in the light. So we had this in the Hastings Museum and Art Gallery, this, this set of pictures. And it's just going to be shown in, in the end of this year, I think, in, in the Pallant Gallery in Chichester as well. So it's going on to another show quite soon. Uh, this guy was actually from Russia. Um, he ended up naked after he did the photo shoot. He spent a lot of time talking about Russia. And, and diving into frozen lakes. So at the end of the photos, he stripped his clothes off and dived into the lake. <laughs> brilliant, <laughs> absolutely brilliant. Yeah, so, yeah. So it's just some of these people. So we did a big exhibition and they're all based on paintings as well from, uh, from the art gallery collection. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think this is where we were gonna stop, wouldn't it? Um, um, Yes, we were going to stop about here um, yeah. because we were going to talk a little bit about the exhibition that you yeah. are in. Um, yeah. And it's good because we've seen some of the pictures, the um, places of prayer. Um, and I think if we sort of talk about where they are and who you're kind of next to and what the, the gist of the exhibition is, because it's called Squaring the Circle or Squaring the Circles of Confusion because... Um, it's basically about the circles of confusion are in an enlarger that, that where you get a focus. But it started off really a conversation with David George and we were talking about pictorialism. And I knew that Michael Pritchard was very, um, he likes pictorialism. Um, I, I mean, we, we kind of had thought about how pictorialism had actually become something like a, you know, like not very sort of contemporary and that, the modernists and the post-industrialists had kind of thought that it was like it was a no-go area. And in the, the sort of the very early history of the Royal Photographic Society, there was huge arguments that sort of waxed and waned about whether you can breathe emotion and feeling into a picture or whether it should be more hard-edged. So anyway, it it kind of the genesis of it kind of came together because so many people, including you, Tom, were actually using very pictorialist techniques in the way that you were working, exactly like from the very beginning of photography, and you were infusing them with kind of feeling and emotion and sort of passion. And then it seemed like, well, Spencer Roll, he was busy making stereographs and it was entirely working through his own sort of um, sort of ancestry and family history. He had done a, like a, a doctorate that was, that was dealing with psychoanalysis and photography. And so for him to be able to make a stereograph 
that you look through the, the 3D viewer and you see in each of the pictures, there is like there is the black dog, which is of depression and the history that sort of run through his family and you see it when you don't see it and it's kind of it was the most the most perfect way so in the exhibition there'll be the stereographs Michael Pritchard has put together a really gorgeous collection of sort of early photo reviewers and then Joy Gregory has used again she's someone that's used Victorian techniques and um, hugely I mean she even when she was at the Royal College she was making gum bichromates and she was making cyanotypes and so that we've got some very recent work of her kind of flaneurs sort of made in lockdown when she was going out for her walk um but we've got some beautiful canotypes that she made that are lost histories because it seemed like the canotype process itself lent itself they're very small they're very intimate and it was about her establishing her own sort of identity and understanding who she was photographing and what it was and how it had to be interpreted in that sort of way and then I love it that your kind of the big painting the Delacroix has got like, it is so infused with Catholicism and that whole kind of devout beautiful sort of Italian Irish beautiful kind of that pure Catholicism but then I love it that we've got like we've got the synagogue which is like a, a beautiful tribute to the Jewish community that's been in Hackney all that time it's like it's kind of bringing quite ancient and beautiful religious traditions you're making very modern statements about the politics of religion in in 21st century but I mean it's with a pinhole there's something that it slows it down it makes it it's such a beautiful way of having rendered something because you had to slow down but I love it that the pictures themselves they speak about people in a kind of meditative state and I, I feel like in very much and then you are next but the person that comes after you is David George and he has been so engaged with the landscape the last 10 15 years and so he's made a set of photo reviewers and it's fascinating that one of the very early photo reviewers is so like one of the ones that David has made up in the northeast but his is 21st century I mean he's looking at what has happened since the Victorian era what has happened to that land but even before the Victorians the Romans were actually making their mark on that land and so that there's beautiful small photograph viewers and then there's his big bold nighttime pictures as he's following the land and then we have Susan Durges and she is she's made very beautiful cameraless pictures of the ocean because she cares passionately that the Victorians plundered the ocean then they left it bereft it's not just the land but also the sea and so we have they're very glorious pictures again they they're kind of in there's some elliptical shapes that are kind of like Victorian cameos they're very beautiful but they're also telling a story of what the Victorians began about the colonial nature this sort of sort of empirical uh statements that you're making she's also making and then we have very very lovely um I think there's 20 daguerreotypes made by Takashi Arai and so Takashi's daguerreotypes that's a very he likes he believed that a daguerreotype isn't a, a single image but it's a whole kind of it's a compilation as time goes on that he can build up a portrait and he's photographed all of these teenagers between 14 and 17 years old they all live in places that have been bombed with nuclear explosion and they're he's asking them all about how, well, how do they see the future none of them care about the fact that they live on nuclear land but they're all very interested in like their computer games and their school and what their after school clubs is very interesting so like the, what the exhibition does is it is bringing together a lot of people thinking actually about very similar issues but using these incredibly expressive techniques and it is such a lovely way and the thing the picture that I sort of have used I, I've written something about the exhibition and the one that I wanted to um sort of I think it expresses so much Gwen is the mother-in-law she's actually died since Ian made the portrait but the last time she came to visit his house she said do I want to be here and so he took a portrait that day and he has made these gum bichromate um, it's like a grid and each part of the grid is 11 layers of gum bichromate. He, it, it took seven months for him to build up this 
glorious portrait of Gwen, who's looking out and it's kind of her last moments, a real kind of cohesive thought. She's already looking sad, but this beautiful ambiance of Gwen is just like, it's, it, she kind of fills the exhibition. It's, it's, it feels like she is, she's the key person in the exhibition. And then Celine Baudin has made um, very uh, sort of uh, loosely focused pictures that you think that you recognize the these sort of Victorian paintings, but in fact they're they're in fact they're they're kind of it's it's to do with memory and it's to do with what we kind of think of the Edwardians and the Victorians. And so Tom, your pictures are the most red thing in the exhibition. There's a lot of red. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I thought it was quite interesting that the way you use beauty so much in that talk. And I remember going to the Royal College and even at the LCP, um, them saying, look, don't use beauty. Beauty is, isn't the thing to do. And I remember having lots of stick when I first just started showing my pictures. They said, well, it's not proper documentary. You can't talk about social issues unless it's in black and white. And I thought, well, actually, why can't you use beauty? Beauty is a way of seducing your audience. And then when you've seduced your audience, then they can engage with the actual the content and the context of the issues that you're trying to talk about, whether it's housing, homelessness, refugees, wherever it is. So I think it's it was really interesting the way there was such a rejection of beauty, but now I think we can embrace it and it can be a useful tool to engage with the world on very complicated and interesting issues. So um, I'm well, very I think you that can say be, beauty and not be scared of saying it. Well, know. I think the, the Pond Moonlight was, an, uh, was a really beautiful mm. Steichen uh, photograph that sold for like untold quantities of money. Yeah. What is very nice is that we've got a 21st century Pond Moonlight in our exhibition that is also absolutely beautiful. And I think beauty is something to be encompassed and endorsed and enjoyed. And I, I, I think that every single person in this exhibition has got something really valid to say, very yeah. valid yeah. to say. And, and, and beauty is an important thing, but beauty for its own sake can be a little bit dross. Well, it's an, a little if bit it's, dull. But, but like this, someone who said from the um, the Dulwich Picture Gallery said, with my picture of the woman reading possession order, it's like you look at it, you're seduced by the beauty, you look at the baby, it's all very lovely, and then you read, it's about an eviction notice. So it's like suddenly there's a hand grenade thrown into it. And I think that's what all these people are doing. They're all using beauty, but then to explore complicated themes and ideologies and issues, which is which makes it have that depth and complexity, which which work should do, I think. I think we should all be challenged. Well, I think that. viva neopictorialism is what yeah. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, do you think we're almost ready for questions now? Yeah. Um, we've got about five minutes left. And so is that about, is that a good idea? That's perfect, Zelda. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, as well. That's um, so insightful. Really, it really was. And it's given me some new insights into your work. And I, I thought I knew well, knew your work, but that's really been great. And thank you, Zelda, for opening, uh, bringing that to the fore with Tom. Um, we've got a couple of questions already. Um, and I'll pick up the first one off um, the Zoom chat. And uh, it's from Maggie, who's wondering if you'd say your work is driven by political themes. Um, yes, I would, yes, say, that. I would say so. <laughs> I would say so. I yeah. would definitely say so. I do remember going to a talk at uh, LCP. Um, and for me, the best thing about going to college for me was going to the artist talks. Um, I don't want to be rude about tutors or anything because we had some great tutors, but the best thing was actually just hearing people talk about their work. And I went to a, a talk in the film department. Um, and we weren't really meant to go there, but I actually go to all the departments, just sniffing out talks. And there was an amazing couple, a Dutch couple, who made a film about abortion. And they said, uh, we've made this film and it's affected me personally, this woman was saying. And she said, that's the wind that drives my sail. It's that wanting to tell a story and wanting uh, an issue to convey to people. Um, and yeah, I can make beautiful pictures all day, but it can be a bit boring um, without a purpose. 
Um, so that political motivation gives me that wind in my sail. It pushes me out of bed and makes me engage with the world. Um, and when I see injustices and things which I don't think are right, like people being misrepresented or marginalised or victimised, then I'm not changing the world. I'm not, I'm not totally deluded, but I'd, I'd like to think that I could do, try and make the world a little bit of a better place if I can. Um, and photography can, can do that. It can change people's minds. It can give a, people a different view on the world and change people's perspectives. Um, so hopefully when people look at my work, they might have thought differently about squatters. Squatters were getting a terrible press at that time. And I remember lots of people coming to that exhibition and the way the council dealt with us after that exhibition was completely different. They treated us with respect. And then from that, we filmed a housing cooperative and we did save our street. So I do believe in change. I do believe in positive good. And I do believe that we can do things. So, um, which isn't very postmodern, I know, but I'm, I'm very old fashioned romantic. In that <laughs> state. And there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that, trust me. Um, so our, our second question is about is asking about scale and about how you, you know, a lot of your work tends to be quite large scale. And, and um, you know, I know myself having seen what's in the gallery downstairs and, and the work you did for us for the Generations exhibition. Um, is that important to you? Is it how you see your work on, on this large scale always or, or is it dependent on, on your subject? Yeah, it very much depends on the subject. The, the Brick Lane pictures, I've just had a, a, uh, an exhibition with that. We've had two exhibitions in libraries in the East End of London. The pictures are 12 by 16 inches, and there's about 50 of them. And I really like that small scale of black and white images where you can get really close to. Um, and it, yeah, it just really works in that medium. But that picture that I showed you referencing Delacroix of the, the, the Italian granddaughter on the bed, that's, I want to, I want you to almost go to the cinema, you know, when you go into your gallery um, and you go to that picture, it's five foot by four foot. And I've shown those pictures in the National Gallery. Um, I'm hoping that you stand in front of it and you can get completely lost within it. And it will be like being at a cinema where you can suspend your disbelief. You can become the protagonist. You can move into that scenario. You can act it out and you can become completely engaged with that. Um, and actually, the, the, the earlier pictures of the tower block with the, um, the older man on the chair and the woman on the sofa in a tower block. Actually, when I first printed those, I printed them, I think it was a uh, 15 foot by eight foot. So they were floor to ceiling inside the empty tower block after everyone got evicted. I blew them up and I pasted them on the wall like wallpaper on the end wall. Um, so yeah, scale is very important. I've also done pictures which are in the model, they're five inches by four inches. And I love that scale. So you have to look in the window and you have to engage in the tiny scale. So it's just purely dependent on what I'm trying to get the audience to engage with. So um, I, hopefully I'll never just do the same scale all the way through without thinking about it. There is a reason yeah. in right, my thank madness. You. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so we've got a question from Simon. We didn't see them this evening, but um, he's asking, how did your per past work influence your approach to your commissions for the Generations Portraits of Holocaust Survivors Project? Yeah, um, it's pretty much, I mean, I, I, I could have put those on. Huh? It's just so much th that same way of working. It was just such an incredible experience taking those pictures um, to meet Holocaust survivors was just the most humbling experience of my life, really, to hear their stories, um, to spend, you know, I think I spent like two, three hours with some of those, some of those people. And they told me about their stories and recorded, we recorded those stories as well. And then again, I feel as though, you know, in some ways, I feel like a, a, a royal court painter from back from the European royal courts back in the medieval times, like go into these people's places and, that large format camera I actually shot in 10, eight and five and in black and white. And I shot on them five by four in color transparency. And it's, it's just trying to get the calmness and trying to get the dignity and trying to get the humanity and getting them to relax within their environment. So they, 
they own the space that they are. I love environmental portraits. I love the environment. And when people are in their, their own homes, they become part of it. And doing long exposures, I don't know what it is about that camera, that big box with that big sheets of film and the light slowly seeping in. It feels like, yeah, it feels like you're sketching or painting or something. And spending that time with them, it's all about slowing, as Zelda said, slowing it down, letting them become comfortable, letting them feel it. Um, uh, yeah, I was so happy with those pictures. I think they look dignified, they look proud, but also you can maybe just see a bit of the struggle that the people have gone through. And that's all my work's about that. I want to show the humanity, the dignity, but also the reality of a situation. So I'm not glossing over what happened to them. You know, they went through hell, unbelievable hell. But to, to be standing after all that and to have that, have that strength to fight off that horrific scenario is just, just incredible. So that's what I want to do with all my pictures. I want to give those people a chance to breathe and the pictures to show that their humanity and dignity. So that's what it's all about. <clears throat> Thank you. That's a wonderful response. Um, just two final quick questions before we, we close this evening. Amy is asking, do you have any future projects and what do they focus on? If you can share that with us. Um, yeah, I'm having a bit of a struggle with my, my latest project. It's been in the pipeline as it, as was the, um, the Holocaust survivors. You know, I think we were just about to set off to do the portraits, weren't we? And then everything closed down. I think in one week I had 10 projects cancelled. Um, and one of them was a project in Sicily. Um, and I've got a friend who lives in Sicily. And we've got a contact in the Royal Palace in Palermo, which is an incredible building dating back to the 11th century, dating back to Norman times. It's gone through all sorts of transformations with religion, culture, people. It's a real stepping stone from Africa to Europe, Sicily. So we're going to do, and it's also, it's got the longest uh, standing parliament in the world in that palace. So we got, we to do a project about democracy. So we're working with different refugee groups um, and all sorts of different types of people. Sic Sicily is very traditional, um, very conservative. And you think about it in terms of the Italians. So I want to bring in different people into different rooms and to explore architecture, the building, and again, dignity of different groups and bring them all together. So from dustbin, dustbin men to judges to um, uh, to refugees to school children, um, we're bringing lots of community groups and try and give them an equal footing and give us all chance to look into other people's lives and to share and maybe care about other people and yeah. So that's what yeah, then, so hopefully I'll be off to Sicily soon. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds perfect. Um, finally, from Maggie, uh, again, just a, a, a quick quick question here. Well, hopefully a quick question. Um, have you got any advice for any photographers starting out? That probably is a bit of a broad question, but perhaps a brief, brief answer yeah. from Maggie. Find something that you believe in. Find something you're passionate about. Um, find something that's interesting you and, and just stay with that. Don't be influenced by other people. But if, if you're interested in, in trees, go for the trees. If you're interested in buildings, people, whatever it is, just follow your heart and follow your passion. And that's always the way. Um, and then your passion will take you forward. Yeah, it's all about passion, I think, and belief. Yeah. Right. That sounds like a perfect note to end on. Um, so firstly, um, the, you can see Tom's work in Square in the Circles, which opens on the 6th of September, that's this Friday, and will remain on show until the 9th of November. Um, do come along, we're doing some workshops and other activities around the exhibition. It is stunning. Um, I've seen a sneak preview um, as it's all Sorry, coming it's Sorry, it starts on the 9th. Uh, so apologies, sorry, 9th, <laughs> yes, I know, it's the wrong way around, yeah, 9th of, uh, sorry, 9th of September to the 6th of November, and also the Generations exhibition that we mentioned, I'm pleased to announce this evening, will also be shown at the Imperial War Museum North, um, and that opens on the 27th of January uh, next year, which is Holocaust M Memorial Day, so there'll be another opportunity to see Tom's work, and I see Gillian Edelstein is in the audience this evening, so gillian has got some wonderful portraits in there as well, so do take the opportunity and this evening thank you Zelda again for for talking to Tom and um, exploring his work with him thank you Tom also for for sharing your insights and, and thoughts about your own work and the history 
And thank you to Joe McDonald, our awards manager, for arranging this evening. And thank you also for your, our audience this evening for joining us. Um, look out for future talks in this series over the next few months. And we'll be sharing this. So if you want to see it again, it will be on YouTube tomorrow. So lots of nice comments coming in now, Tom, which I'll share with you tomorrow. Thank you, everyone, and good night. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Zelda. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.